Good evening, everyone. My name is Jonathan Pearson. It's a pleasure to be with you tonight. Senator Menendez uh, mentioned the Sexual Assault Advisory Council, and we're going to put in the chat a link to the 2021 report issued by the Sexual Assault Advisory Council on ways in which the Peace Corps continues to need to move forward and improve. And there are dozens of recommendations in that report. The current law is that that Sexual Assault Advisory Council would discontinue its work at the end of 2023. And one of the things in the Peace Corps Reauthorization Act is an extension of the work of the Sexual Assault Advisory Council to the end of 2025. So as you heard from Congressman Garamendi and Senator Menendez, uh, there's a lot of information and important things in this uh, legislation. We're going to hear from people who have been working on these issues, in some cases for many, many years. And we're going to have a panel here of really great advocates and, and, and personal uh, champions of certain issues that we will just give a little more substance to uh, this evening. I first wanna bring on an incredible advocate for RPCVs who uh, have come home with service-related illnesses and injuries. And that's Nancy Tung, who served in Chile. And she's the founder of the group Health Justice for Peace Corps Volunteers. So Nancy, I hope we'll get you on the screen here momentarily. And uh, as, as you're coming on, I, I will start by asking uh, this question. As was mentioned, one of the things that is in the bill uh, was that Congressman Garamendi referenced is this, uh, the, the rate of workers' compensation uh, from a, what's called a GS-7 to a GS-11 level. And you were at the meeting where the decision was made and the strategy came forward on how to go and make that request. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? All right, well, uh, first of all, I wanna say that there's been a history of people through the years wanting to protect the Peace Corps' reputation over working for reform. And that might be some of the pushback that Senate, uh, Representative Garamendi came up against. So I just wanna say that I'm grateful to all of you for pushing this forward, um, trying to get uh, reform possible. And for anybody who's watching for your willingness to advocate on behalf of all of the issues that are coming forth today and for the bill. But first of all, I can't speak of the disability income without actually addressing issues of medical bill payments because pretty much anybody who's sick, all of their bill, all of their uh, income is gonna go to pay medical bills. And that's because the medical system is also broken. But the, the simple answer to, to Jonathan's question about um, uh, the issue about the GS7 step one level, uh, why do we need to reform that? And that's because $25,600 a year is very hard for a sick volunteer to live on. Um, it puts one over the limit for Medicaid. It's one at the poverty level, slightly above and high enough that we can't access Medicaid, but not enough to buy health insurance. Um, before the Affordable Air Care Act came about, RPCVs who came back sick and injured couldn't get health insurance in the US because all service related issues were considered to be pre existing. Um, my parents paid a tremendous amount, uh, lost their home, in fact, trying to keep me alive. So the original Peace Corps Act determined that a volunteer is valued at GS7 Step 1, which is uh, about $38,000, $37,900. And if you look at what disability pays, it's 66 and two-thirds of that amount. And at the time this was set up, the equivalent of $37,900 was probably about the amount that a graduate with one year or two year work experience would start out with, with a bachelor's degree. But uh, that's not really 20, 66 and two thirds is not a reliable amount that somebody can live on today. Um, so in 2014, I met with uh, represent, um, Mm, I'm switching to a new section. You met with uh, Carrie Hessler Radlin, as I recall. The well, I met with well, I met with Carrie originally, and she really was unfamiliar with a lot of these issues and how much people got. I had been active in reform in 1988, in fact, and all of that material was missing from the Peace Corps. Uh, I had pushed to have somebody hired to work on this issue in uh, uh, 1988. 
and to increase the level. And she had also worked with um, Department of Labor, but it didn't go through. So again, Ke Kerry was not aware of any of this. So she helped organize a meeting with uh, Deputy Secretary of Labor, Chris Liu, and each of his 12 regional specialists. Uh, they showed up along with Carrie and all of her upper level staff. And I had put together a proposal and a report for the Department of Labor that involved three different problem areas. So the first was someone to broker between the sick volunteer, Peace Corps and labor about health issues because we are left to ourselves with no one to broker for us. The other issue was to have one regional office in the Department of Labor that handled all uh, 12 regional areas. Um, because right now, if you move to one area and your claim is in one of other 11 areas, your claim may not necessarily be forwarded. You may lose your claim altogether, in fact. You'll have a different claims examiner. There may be no history of your claim. The third was to raise the disability income level. Um, having gone through the previous Peace Corps acts, I pro proposed the GS-11 level because there was a track record of it. The language was there because anybody returning with a child or somebody th serving a third year was placed at a GS-11. So it seemed like it would be easy not to have to reinvent the whole level of that. Um, it seemed like it would pass without too much difficulty. That level is uh, $57,000 rounded out. Two, 66 and two thirds of that is $37,900. And that would be an increase for us of about $12,000 a year. Um, I just wanna go back to say that that sounds like a lot of money, but given the fact that Peace Corps doesn't offer any, Peace, let me recap, Peace Corps doesn't offer disability or health insurance. Uh, um, it brokers with the Department of Labor to get medical bills and, um, disability approved. They remain the fiduciary that pays for all bills. So if there's a service related issue, Peace Corps has to submit an application for benefits or for a claim through the Department of Labor. They adjudicate. If it's approved, then medical treatment can be begun. Um, I wanna say that there is uh, a, a financial interest on the part of the Peace Corps to not encourage Peace Corps volunteers to necessarily apply for disability um, or to get medical bills reimbursed. It's unusual that any agency that or an organization doesn't have an outside insurance company that um, uh, doesn't have interest in uh, paying for the bills. So this is a really odd situation. Um, if a health issue is deemed related to service, the volunteer can obtain medical care through a provider of their choice. The caveat in that is the provider, if they wanna be paid, they have to be registered with FICA. Um, FICA is a program that, uh, FICA has to, the, the participant has to figure out how to enroll for FICA. That process can take about two years and it's mind-numbingly difficult. I haven't encountered a single practitioner who's willing to do what it takes to do, to do that paperwork. Uh, the majority of health providers who are already FICA enrolled do not deal with the kinds of health issues that Peace Corps volunteers have, such as tropical disease, infectious diseases, uh, certain kinds of mental health issues. Even hey, Nancy, if a claim is, I'm, 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 for the, uh, I'm watching our our time here because we uh, want to make sure we give some time to the other okay. panelists. So, and we'll have an opportunity to talk more and share more of this information okay. as we work through this process um, in the coming weeks and months. Thank you so much for everything that you've done uh, and especially around the, the workers' compensation issue in the bill. I uh, next wanna bring up a woman named Sarah who Senator Menendez uh, uh, mentioned. He mentioned a, a volunteer named Sarah from New Jersey and that's Sarah Thompson. So the Sarah that he was mentioning is right here with us. Uh, Sarah, thank you so much for your advocacy like Nancy you both have been at this for years and years and years, and you've been working with congressional leaders on language, first of all, to provide better protections regarding the use of mefloquine in malaria countries. Could you speak a little bit about that and, and where, what, where things are at? 
Yeah, sure. Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate this. And as Senator Menendez said, I served in Burkina Faso, West Africa, which is a country where malaria is prevalent. Um, as such, Peace Corps mandates that its volunteers take an anti-malarial medication. At the beginning of my service, I was handed a bag with mefloquin in it and signed a document that indicated that I was warned of the risk of this drug. During my service, my symptoms were not taken seriously by the Peace Corps medical officer, nor was I offered an alternative anti-malarial drug. In hindsight, these symptoms were signs that I was experiencing mefloquine toxicity. After returning to the state sick, my research revealed that Peace Corps should have given me mefloquine in the States before I left for Africa to monitor for side effects per CDC guidelines. Every American, except Peace Corps volunteers, starts this drug in the States before traveling, as Nancy just very um, in great detail explained that when you come back sick, you're unable to access medical care or benefits through the Department of Labor's FECA program. Because of this, I filed a lawsuit against Peace Corps. The judge dismissed my lawsuit because, um, because US courts do not have uh, jurisdiction for issues that originate overseas. And this supported my suspicion that Peace Corps was specifically waiting to distribute mefloquine to evade legal liability despite the availability of safer, less toxic anti-malarial medication. So this legislation does suggest that Peace Corps consult with experts at the CDC, but it does not unfortunately mandate that Peace Corps be compliant with CDC guidelines. The legislation does also indicate that um, it's important to train Peace Corps medical officers to recognize the side effects of this medication. However, because side effects of mefloquine are normalized and not taken seriously, this language also should have been stronger, in my opinion. Regardless, I am very grateful for this legislation and it's certainly a step in the right direction. And it's certainly acknowledgement that this sort of uh, issue needs legislative attention. And, and Sarah, I know um, we could go more into these issues, the, the other issue you've been working very hard on with mm -hmm. Congress and the National Whistleblower Center is to provide the strongest possible language to protect volunteers from reprisal and retaliation. Um, talk about those efforts. Yeah, sure. Um, so after um, you know, I filed the lawsuit against Peace Corps and after it was dismissed, I actually filed a whistleblower claim against Peace Corps because I'd heard that you can hold a federal agency accountable for mismanagement and uh, specific dangers to public health and safety. So similar to the lawsuit, I wrote my own disclosure summary and affidavit, and four other volunteers and a mefloquine toxicity specialist joined me in solidarity by also submitting affidavits to push for transparency and accountability. Unfortunately, less than two, it took less than two weeks for the Office of Special Counsel to dismiss my whistleblower claim because volunteers are not considered federal employees. So my post-Peace Corps journey really reflects the fact that volunteers have no avenue with which to hold Peace Corps accountable. And without such accountability, Peace Corps can operate with impunity and continue to be non-compliant with their own rules and regulation. So as such, I have organized hundreds of meetings with congressional offices to seek support for specific legislative provision that I have drafted to protect the health, safety, and security of the volunteer. One of these provisions allows the volunteer access to whistleblower resources to hold Peace Corps accountable for gross federal mismanagement and substantial and specific dangers to public health and safety. Um, contrary to what Honorable Representative Garamendi just claimed, um, due to the amendments as introduced by Representative Meeks, who is the chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, the House version of this bill was drastically amended from the original whistleblower provision that was drafted by a prominent whistleblower attorney who I've been working with. Um, so as such, the final version of the House bill um, is not as strong as the Senate bill. Um, and so through many conversations with the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, as Honorable Senator Menendez just relayed, the Senate version of the whistleblower provision reflects stronger language, allowing the volunteer to access external oversight when filing complaints against Peace Corps. Through filing this, I just wanna be clear, you know, through filing this lawsuit, and in addition to the whistleblower claim, as well as my continued advocacy on the Hill, my goal is not only to hold Peace Corps accountable, but also to ensure for the health, safety, and security of the volunteer. It is only through healthy and safe volunteers that Peace Corps can fulfill its mission 
and thrive as an agency to become a beacon of change and hope, you know, as we've been discussing all night. So thanks so much, Jonathan, for your time. I have very much appreciated NPCA support. Um, I know we've had multiple conversations about this and I just, I really wanna thank you guys for allowing me the platform to speak tonight. So thank you very much. Thank I do you. appreciate it. Thank you so much, Sarah. And our third panelist and final panelist is Jack Wilson. There's another provision in the bill that was referenced by Congressman Garamendi. It, there's a standalone bill. Uh, it's called the Respect for Peace Corps Volunteers Act. Very simply, it's a bill that would say uh, Peace Corps volunteers could use a, a, a symbol of the Peace Corps at grave sites or in um, uh, death notices to honor their service. Um, Jack, talk about your involvement in this effort over the years. Well, this is an issue that uh, some of us have been thinking about uh, for some time. Uh, I'm a 60s volunteer, but I'm, I think it's fair to say that the 60s, 70s, and 80s return volunteers may be beginning to uh, recognize their, their mortality. And as a part of that, some of us uh, would like to be able to use the Peace Corps name and the Peace Corps emblem uh, with uh, death notices and grave markers. The current Peace Corps Act forbids that, in fact, provides penalties for such use. Now, the proposed legislation, as I understand it, uh, very simply uh, does away with that uh, old language, or current language, I should say, which I think is in section 19 of the act and would allow uh, the official seal and emblem uh, of the Peace Corps to be used on death notices or on uh, gravestones. And that would apply to return Peace Corps volunteers, uh, people who have worked for the Peace Corps, uh, and uh, any employee for that matter, I think and the director of the Peace Corps would uh, create a procedure or uh, adopt some regulations that would, would control it. I think it's worth noting that these, the current restrictions were not in the original Peace Corps Act. They were added actually in 1963 because Peace Corps had been so popular, the name uh, taken by inappropriately by some organizations and people. And so this provision was put in uh, to uh, forbid its, its uh, use uh, and penalties added. Uh, I think Many of us over the years for uh, differing reasons have visited cemeteries where we've seen um, military markers, but also markers for the Coast Guard, the Foreign Service, uh, the FBI, either emblems or actually something on the gravestone. So, we believe that Peace Corps volunteers who have served their country should have that same opportunity to be recognized at their death. And that's all this change does. Thank you so much, Jack, and, uh, and others who have been bringing attention to this as well. So I want to thank all of our panelists tonight uh, for joining this first round. We'll have a second panel coming up shortly.